We want to thank you all for coming tonight um, and braving the polar vortex to be with us. We're very excited to be here celebrating another success for one of our uh, most well-known nutrition alumni, Ellie Krieger. We're very excited to hear from her in a few moments and learn a little bit more about the process that she used um, in creating Weeknight Wonders and maybe uh, hearing from her about her perspective on that. And I think we'll definitely have some time for a few um, questions and answers before we move on to the book signing portion of the evening. So during the reception, we will be featuring some samples inspired by the cookbook itself. And so we um, encourage you to enjoy that. If you haven't brought your own copy of the book and have not yet purchased one, there'll still be some available in the back. I just wanted to, again, thank you all for being a part of our lineup of activities right now here on campus. This is a very exciting time to be engaged with Teachers College. This week, we're officially closing the books on our 125th anniversary, and we're beginning a new chapter by embarking on our historic campaign. We've been celebrating our illustrious history, all the while maintaining an eye on what is yet to come. Where the future comes first, the Campaign for Teachers College will help to foster the great work going on right now at Teachers College in education, psychology, leadership, and health, all of which has the potential to make an enormous impact on children, families, communities, and organizations throughout the country and the world. But this work is going to require an enormous financial investment, and this campaign is about ensuring that TC's faculty and students have the support they need to lead the way as investors and pioneers in shaping the future of teaching and learning. It's also the largest fundraising campaign ever undertaken by a school of education. Student support is going to be our number one priority of the campaign, followed closely by our commitment to investing in faculty work so that they can build on their successes. Funds will support scholarships, research, endowed chairs, innovation grants, cross-disciplinary programs, and initiatives that have an impact on research, policy, and professional practice, such as our newly launched Laurie M. Tisch Center for Food, Policy, and Education, which Pam Cook will share a little bit more about in just a few minutes. We also plan to enhance the physical infrastructure on campus to remain competitive with peer institutions and utilize the most cutting edge technology. You might find yourself asking, what makes this campaign for Teachers College unique? As an institution, TC is unique in that we house extensive programs in psychology and health as well as education. This leads to opportunities for cross-pollination between disciplines and has led to innovations at the college, such as this new program with our um, nutrition policy. It has also led to advances in research on learning progressions, answering questions like, how do students really learn? And then incorporating that into our teacher prep programs. Teachers College has been and continues to be a hotbed of pioneering research put into practice, and the campaign will provide the necessary infusions of funds to support these new frontiers. So I encourage you to learn more about how you can help to support the future, which we believe begins here at Teachers College. I also encourage you to continue to be part of these exciting events and especially to join us on April 12th for Academic Festival. We will once again um, showcase the nutrition program in a cooking demonstration in the Earth Friends Center, so we encourage you to join us for that, as well as um, other opportunities to connect with the college. So stay tuned for more information. At this time, I'm going to invite Pam Cook, the adjunct assistant professor in our nutrition program, and the project coordinator and executive director of the new Lori M. Tisch Center for Food, Education, and Policy at Teachers College to join me. She's going to share a few updates from the nutrition program and introduce our very own Ellie Krieger. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. And I want to really welcome you on behalf of Dr. Isabel Contento, who is the chair of the program and wanted me to send her warm regards. And she loves when Ellie comes here to speak and talk about her cookbooks and stuff. And I think Ellie actually really does a great job of exemplifying all that we do in the program at our new center, what we are really trying to do is bridge the intersection of doing great quality nutrition education that really changes the way people eat at the same time as we are trying to increase access to people having healthy food. And um, just to share with all of you, actually Ellie and I were students here together way back when, and we, um, 
really at that time had no idea that we would still be in touch. And I got to really have the privilege and opportunity to work alongside with Ellie because our children went together to the same public school on the Upper West Side. And I can tell you that Ellie um, was so influential in making sure that we had a really, really strong wellness policy. And because of her work with Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign that was really to help Michelle Obama get that started, we decided that we would embark on, mostly through the work of Ellie, to become the first New York City school to be um, recognized by the USDA as a healthier US school challenge school. That meant that we were actually making sure that nutrition education went across all the grade levels. And there was a lot of changes that actually had a take place within the school food environment in New York City, and Ellie's work already with the school food, food environment to share her recipes, improve the menus there, ended up really to help make that happen. Um, and so I think that we also do a lot of work in schools and doing education, and I feel like it's a wonderful thing to have Ellie here, and I think you'll be delighted to hear what she has to say, because she'll not only talk about the recipes and what they are, but also what it takes to actually create a cookbook like this. So welcome, Ellie. Thank you. Thanks, Rosella, and thank you, Pam. I have to say it was an honor to work with you, and what I mean, now that's a great team for a public school to have, to, you know, nutritionists from teacher co Teachers College to say, we're making change around here, and it, we really wound up galvanizing the whole community. So it wasn't just us, it was, you know, a whole wellness committee that we formed with interested parents, and it was a wonderful experience and a great experience to get to know you even more, you know, in working together than um, in school. So it's wonderful. And we're certainly on the same page, which is nice philosophically. You know, we knew that. Um, and that's one thing the Teachers College has, you know, given us both. And Pam continues to, you know, provide that legacy to others. And I have to say, you know, Rosella asked me to explain, you know, what are some of the things that inspire you to write books in general and what inspired you to write this book and, and inspired the content. And I have to say that in thinking about it, it's very personal and it's also professional. And at my very, very heart, you know, people say, okay, you have a TV show and you're writing for magazines and newspapers and you're writing cookbooks and all. It seems all over the place, but in my very, very heart, I am a nutrition educator. And it's quite simple to me because that's really what I'm doing. And I am providing nutrition education, and that's what drives me, and that's what I'm passionate about. And I use everything that I learned here at Teachers College. Um, and so um, Isabel you know, had wanted to be here tonight, but she just, for example, I think a recipe is a perfect nutrition education tool. And so, for example, I mean, and I can specify why, um, courtesy of Isabel Contento, and, and it's really quite thought out in that way from me, because I do look at it as a nutrition education tool, although it might not be apparent like that toward the public. Um, so, for example, it reaches people on a very emotional and very physical level, just taste taste in itself, to tap into that motivation. People want food that tastes good. So immediately you're doing that. You're giving the promise of that even before they even tried it. Even better if you get to make it for them and, and they taste it and they like it, and then they're really motivated. Then um, there's also, you can really bridge cultural gaps or you can really um, connect with people from all different cultures, from all different places, through food, because we all eat, and we all have basically some kind of taco-like thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no matter where you're from. And so, <laughs> right? And so we, we have this incredible commonality. It's our ultimate humanity is food. Um, it also brings, a meal brings people together, brings families together, and so there's that social aspect of it. And then there's a huge aspect of self-efficacy, that if you can create a recipe and, and inspire someone to try a recipe that they can do, that's not that hard, that's a cost effective for them, um, and that uses ingredients that they have access to easily, um, that really makes them feel like they can do it. And suddenly they can do it and it tastes good. And then what I love, this part, is they generally share it with their friends. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have to try this recipe. Which, that's the most fun thing for me. And actually, just on a side note, you know, I've been on this book tour for a couple of weeks now. And my favorite thing is meeting you all, like meeting people that cook my meatloaf, for goodness sakes. Like, it is such a great connection um, with people. And I do feel like it makes the world so much 
of a smaller place and then they tell two friends and and I do feel like it is something that I feel like I'm in people's <laughs> lives in an intimate way in their kitchens um, and so it's a really wonderful thing from that perspective um, also per, on a and that's I guess on one personal level that is something that truly motivates me that kind of feedback um, but also I'm motivated because I basically like the food I make. <laughs> and then I swear to you, that is the one of the biggest reasons I cook, is because I just like my food, and I can't buy it like that. <laughs> it's really quite simple. And, and I do think that that's one of the best reasons and inspirations to get people to cook, is that you can make it the way you like it. Um, and I also am quite busy, and I find I need quick meals. And so I find that the solutions for me are also, you know, because I'm, I'm demanding. I want food that's delicious and healthy and also that I can do with a crazy, hectic life. And so um, I feel like if that's meeting my needs and that's meeting a lot of people's needs, I feel like I'm my own customer and my little family are, is, is, is part of that kind of feedback group. Um, so it was funny because I had handed in the manuscript for the book and then I, maybe a few weeks later, I was thinking, what am I going to make tonight for dinner? Oh, my God, I have to get this done before my daughter has to go to chorus. I'm like, wait a second, I have 150 recipes. <laughs> <laughs> like I, so I found it to be a treasure, treasure trove for myself. Um, and, and truly, the book is 30-minute um, recipes. So it's weeknight wonders, delicious healthy dinners in 30 minutes or less. And I, I found, I really timed it. Like I included chopping everything, I included preheating anything, I included anything that needs to boil, and it really all needs to take that 30 minutes. And what I did was I also cut the onion like kind of slow. So that, <laughs> I did, I'm not even kidding. And <laughs> just so it would be very realistic. Um, and so I make sure it really fit into that time frame. And because of that, I start, I actually wrote the recipes in a different kind of way than I typically do. So I started thinking about it. Most cookbooks and everyone that I've written before, um, traditionally you, it says like one onion chopped, one carrot diced, and so on. And so it sort of implies that you have everything, that you have a sous chef basically, <laughs> which not that many people or well, I guess I know maybe one person who has a sous chef. <laughs> Not me. Um, uh, I do have a dishwasher, though. My husband's really good with dishes <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and tasting things. But, um, um, but anyway, so what, how I wrote it was I just said one onion, one carrot, and so on. And I just told you the raw ingredients that you basically need to have out on your counter. And then as um, in the method, I put in heat the oil in the pan. While the oil's heating, chop the onion. And so I sort of tell you, while the broth is coming to a simmer, wash the lettuce and cut it, or whatever that might be. So I really, I think that's how most people cook. Um, but sometimes people, if they're not as comfortable in the kitchen, might not know to, to do that. And they might, you know, really lay out all the ingredients. And so I really try to do that homework for you, like what you can fit into what little pockets of time to make it work for a half hour. So I thought that was kind of fun, and I've, I've gotten some great feedback of people finding that super helpful. Um, and also, so I also do other things in the book, To um, One thing I learned is that when you only have a half hour, you really can't roast that many things <laughs> if you're including preheating in the oven. So the only thing in there you'll find is roast that's roasted is asparagus, <laughs> which happens to be with one of my, uh, most of the meals either are meal in themselves, or I suggest, or, or that it's sort of something that does double duty, like um, while you're making this wonderful fish uh, sole with savory breadcrumbs, you're also cooking asparagus alongside it because it cooks at the same time. And then I kind of recommend side dishes and so on to pair with it that will keep it in the 30 minute frame. So um, I have in the book appetizers, appetizer salads, main course salads, soups, and also desserts. And so you'll get to try some, some stuff today. But, um, but I, I take advantage of ingredients like, so I use only, you know, nothing with artificial ingredients, no additives, nothing like this. Mostly really simple, pure scratch cooking ingredients. Um, but I do use some healthy shortcuts. So I often say this, and I really want to shake the hand of the person who invented pre-washed greens, because like that stuff's great. I know, and I think this is something that's important to me too, because I'm really very much a pragmatist. And I know that I love when I go to my farmer's market, and my farmer, you know, Rick Bradley, I know the guy, I know what he has, I get his emails, I want to know what he has that week. 
And I, when I buy spinach from him and it still has dirt clinging to it, and I wash it, and I wash it once, and then it still has dirt clinging to it, so I wash it again. <laughs> and that is amazing spinach. And I know for me, that's the ideal, right? But that just is not going to happen every week. It's just not. And so I buy the box spinach, and I buy the box lettuce that's pre-washed too, and I find it sometimes makes the difference between dinner happening and ordering in. <laughs> You know, and so if it, that's the case, and I think in America, that's what's realistic. And I really try to take that kind of approach. And so I use healthy shortcuts like pre-washed greens, frozen butternut squash puree. So things that are essentially um, minimally processed, but make it easier to get um, dinner on the table. Or like squash that's cut into chunks. Like, you know what, sometimes it's fine, <laughs> right, to do that, um, especially on a busy night. And then I also take advantage of quick cooking whole grains. So quinoa um, is, I have some really nice quinoa recipes. Um, um, what else? Uh, bulgur, fine grain bulgur. I love to work with uh, whole grain pizza dough, and this is a convenient convenience food ingredient. You can make your own and freeze it and so on, but they make, they have really good ones for sale that are whole grain. And it's just one of those things that I have a bunch of really great pizzas. And I think you get to try one tonight with a broccoli pesto as the base um, on top of that and some goat cheese. And um, anyway, so those kinds of convenience ingredients and quick cooking whole grains are really, and as well as quick cooking proteins. And I have lots of uh, vegetarian recipes in this book too. But the other thing that I want to tell you is a couple of ways that I'm inspired because people often ask me like, how do you come up with this many recipes? How do you, you know, what inspires you to think of these things? So the first like 75 recipes, you know, I was like rattling them off, had these ideas, cooking them, getting it done. And then I swear to you, I thought there were no more recipes in the entire <laughs> world that would take 30 minutes. I could, I was just completely hit a wall. And it was really interesting because then I just took a couple of weeks off and just kind of looked on my Instagram feed, looked at magazines, went to restaurants, went to farmers markets, just kind of opened my eyes and just got, got a little refreshed. And then it came, you know, and then it was amazing. It was like opening up a well with so many more ideas. So it's sort of amazing how that creative process is. And then I, in terms of that, I wanted to tell you two stories which sort of reflect how I get inspiration for flavors. One is I was cutting up some fresh fennel for salad, which I just love. Fennel and arugula salad is one of my favorite things. And so I'm cutting that up, and my daughter was eating a nectarine. And she just like snatched a piece of the fennel and said, Mom, these two taste so good together. <laughs> I said, let me try. And so I tried it. I was like, you are so right. That's delicious. And um, I'm making a recipe with fennel and, 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 and nectarines. And so, so was born my fennel nectarine salad with um, crispy prosciutto and a citrus dressing. It's so delicious. One of my favorite salads in the book. And then another one was I was in a farmer's market, and I was just looking around, and this woman was selling focaccia, different kinds of bread, but she had this focaccia that had grapes, fresh grapes that were roasted in the bread, and fennel seed. And I love this flavor combination. I was asking her about it, and she said it's very common in Italian food to mix grapes and fennel. And so I said, well, I started really thinking, what can I do with fennel? And I love fennel and pork. And then how can I work grapes in there? Well, you know, you can make pork with apples. And I wound up coming up with this um, fennel seed uh, <coughs> crusted, basically, um, pork tenderloin with fresh fennel and grapes. And um, it's a really quick saute, and it, the sauce is delicious. And um, so that was just something that um, is also now one of my favorite recipes. But it's just sort of like using, you know, running with it, sort of when you meet these combinations that you love. And then other times, I just create a recipe because I happen to be laying in bed craving it, like, oh my god, I want meatballs so badly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty much always. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think we're having meatballs today. But, um, Anyway, so that's essentially, you know, how I, how I go through that process, and, and it's really fun and wonderful. And so from the beginning of creating the recipes to this end point where I get to share it with everyone, I have to say it's a very joyful experience for me, and a ton of work, but a very joyful work. And also, to me, again, the bottom line is that I am a nutrition educator in my very heart of hearts, so feeding people, it's fun. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions that you may have, or... 
um, comments, ideas? Yes? I'm just curious, um, when you create a recipe, do you test it on, like, for example, on your family or on your friends, or how do you decide whether it's going to be good or not? Yeah, I mean, I mainly go by, so I have in the kitchen with me at, on the day of the testing is a culinary assistant and who has like an educated palate of, you know, and also it's interesting because we know each other's palates, like she doesn't like spicy. If I put like one drop of cayenne pepper, she's like, oh, it's going to be so spicy. And I like things spicy, so it's kind of good because we can balance each other. And then I also have a nutrition assistant who doesn't, isn't in the kitchen with me. She's a registered dietitian. Often she does research, nutrition analysis and stuff. And so she has a whole different palate. So everyone in the office sort of will taste it. Um, and then I also have um, a recipe developer who I work with who is a chef. And then we taste each other's. So it's mainly this little team of, I guess, four of us that we taste everything. And then my daughter, and mostly I come home with dinner, and my <laughs> daughter and husband will will taste and you know I, they are not shy about their opinions either so which is good so and then my doormen love me <laughs> they totally love me I'm like here I made these muffins 20 times you want? <laughs> yes uh, generally I find that home cooking is much better than restaurant cooking but you mentioned that you go to restaurants Name a few that actually are worth going to where you feel you get the value and you get good uh, creativity, good ideas for your home cooking, which is wow. Well, so I love going to restaurants, and I think. There's so much creative energy in New York City in the food world that it kind of knocks my socks off all the time. Um, and then it's easy to pay a lot for a bit for a not so great meal. <laughs> too. But I think, well, just in this neighborhood, one of my favorite restaurants, I live on the Upper West Side. So I love Gennaro. Have anyone ever been to Gennaro? It's on Amsterdam and, God bless you, on 92nd. And he makes like, essentially, he's a um, Italian, Sicilian cook. And he just like his kale salad, actually, is what I base the one in my book on his kale salad. So I find the flavors amazing. I find it to be a good value and a really mellow, like, neighborhood place. So I, I recommend that. But I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, I, I happen to love the food scene in New York. And a lot of times I find things that in res food in restaurants very salty. Yes. And I have this theory, and I'm, I have n it's not based on any kind of study, but I, I think it's probably true <laughs> that I think they get, I think chefs get palate fatigue and they keep tasting it, and then they keep putting salt in, and they wind up, they've tasted it so many times that they get, you know, tired of, you know, they become inured to the amount of salt in it. So um, that's one of the issues that I find with, with restaurant food, is that it's often too salty. Yes. But I love that place. I'm trying to think of, have you been to, here, this is more upscale, but it's really fabulous in terms of healthy food, Rouge Tomate. It's on the Upper East Side, um, and it's upscale place, like I said, but it follows the what they call this principle SPE, um, uh, sanitas per escom, right? And it means health through food. And they won a Michelin star, and um, and it, so it's fabulous food that happens to also be really healthful preparations and local sustainable model of of ingredient selection. So. That's a huge inspiration to me, too, because they're doing some really interesting things there. Yes? So I, uh, I am suddenly having to change my entire diet for my son and I, and I have to take gluten out. How easy is it to take these recipes in particular and make them gluten-free? Right. I mean, so I think for the most, I have a lot of just recipes in there that are going to be already gluten-free. Um, so something like the pork recipe, or the um, or the fennel and and uh, and nectarine salad. I have lots of soups, for example, and so I would just watch if you were using, you know, a boxed broth. You just want to make sure, you know. But um, and then so I would say the only ones that you really maybe wanted to avoid were the sandwiches and pizzas and things like that, just for the bread factor. But I actually have some really nice. Um, like with the bulgur salad, I made this, um, there's this fabulous warm bulgur salad that I, t I take, the, take the bulgur and I put it warm on top of chopped greens, top chopped um, 
spinach and herbs, and then I toss it, and the warmth from the bulgur kind of like wilts it a little and activates the aromas and the herbs. It's so delicious. And then I put feta on top and then grapes. <laughs> um, and you can make it into a vegetarian main course, put some walnuts on it, or I serve it as like a side. And it's sort of like a salad grain combo, that double duty kind of thing that I was talking about. But you could totally make that using quinoa, for example, or rice or brown rice um, instead of bulgur. So it's easy. I think it's fairly easy to make those substitutions in the book. And then I do have a great sesame quinoa um, which is a side dish that, and I think it's really important to take simple foods and make them really flavor forward in an easy way. So that's always my goal. Um, and so I put in a little toasted sesame oil and some toasted sesame seeds and stir those in and some scallions. And it's such a lovely side dish that way that goes with a lot of Asian um, inspired mains and simple, fast, and still flavorful though, instead of just plain steamed grains. Anyway. So good, best wishes. I mean, I think there are so many options, and now especially, that, I mean, 20 years ago, I think it was a whole other ball game with gluten-free. And I also can recommend some gluten-free cookbooks, too, because I, I know some, some good ones, if you want. <laughs> yes? My question is, I, I see that you have the recipes, but let's say, like, I like to make things ahead of time. So on a Sunday, I'll make a few dishes. Mm -hmm. How is it freezing these dishes where it tastes as good when I go that like Thursday to warm it up, would it still have the same taste or should I freeze it a certain way? Yeah, some. So this book is really designed for like eat it now for the most part, but soups, for example, and pretty much any soup, as long as it's not like a cream based soup, pretty much any of the soups are freezable. Um, and, um, and then my, uh, my previous book, I think Comfort Food Fix, which has more stews and chilies. Oh, I do have a really great chili, Rush Hour Chili in this book. That would freeze very well. And it's literally like less than 10 ingredients. It's all, so I went on a little ski trip and rented an apartment. And I you know, made this chili with things that I bought just like at the supermarket for that one week trip that's so low maintenance and so delicious and belly warming. And you can totally freeze it. And you t can totally make it in less than 30 minutes. So I think people think of um, chili as like this thing that takes all day on a Sunday. And so I'm trying to dispel that. And, and you could make it that way. That's a d different technique. But So the chili would be great. Soups would be great. Anything that has a moisture in it already. I wouldn't necessarily freeze something like the pork saute that I was talking about. So. <laughs> Yeah. Well, luckily, sesame seeds and capers could probably sit in your fridge for like a year <laughs> for whatever that's worth. And then I might literally like, hmm, what can I do with these capers? I think I'll make a dipping sauce with, you know, some, you know, I think I'll make like a sauce for some fish with some capers in it. I mean, so sometimes I'll see what I have and just do it like that. But yeah, I think for the most part, you don't want to buy ingredients that I try to avoid telling people to buy like truffle oil or whatever that you're going to use once, you know, and it's just going to sit. Oh, were you just <laughs> talking about that? Well, I bought it. I used it once and then I gave it to her. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm try I try to be cognizant of that in general. And actually, you're going to be getting a recipe today. Um, I think there's a recipe card that you all get that has um, smoked paprika in it. And it's um, spinach, uh, spinach and shrimp with toasted garlic and smoked paprika. And that's like an ingredient, for example, that I think... I will tell you right now like 10 ways to use smoked paprika, that it's so delicious. And it, it, it sort of transforms the simplest foods. Recently I made um, smoked paprika, just like steamed potatoes, some new potatoes, and I just put a little olive oil and then sprinkled smoked paprika, and everyone's like, oh my god, what is in this? It was like the <laughs> easiest thing. Um, you, can, you can whisk it into a little olive oil and lemon juice um, as a uh, salad dressing. You can sprinkle it on eggs. You can put it in egg salad type dishes. You can put it in potato salad. Um, it's really nice on seafood, in like a seafood sprinkle. So that's, I try to use only ingredients that I think you can use in multiple ways. So yeah, I mean, and then sometimes I'll really look for, oh, what can I do with sesame seeds? But I think you could, the problem is you forget about them. Because you can just put them on a stir fry um, or put them in your rice. 
and just sprinkle them in there. And it's one of those things that adds so much texture and flavor that it's worth it. <laughs> Would any supermarket have smoked paprika? Or you have to go so to actually, and that was that's the other thing. I try to use ingredients that are just accessible that you don't have to go to a specialty market for. And I used to never put it in my recipes until McCormick started coming out with it. Oh. And they make it, so... Um, I don't know if every supermarket will carry every spice, but it's extremely, you know, it's very much in the mainstream in terms of being, you know, that part of that brand. So, um, so yeah, you can buy it in pretty much, I guess, in any supermarket. You can definitely buy it. Do you have a favorite supermarket? I shop all over. I go to Whole Foods because my office is sort of near there. I go to, I order from Fresh Direct. I go to Fairway. I go to my West Side Market. And I go to my... Um, we have like some good markets up around here. Sort of depends what I want, but I like to shop the farmers market whenever I can. <laughs> Do you have a favorite market? Whole Foods, I think, has better produce, better fish, much better fish than Fairway. Well, I don't oh, know what you say that. oh, <laughs> you're being recorded. <laughs> um, actually, I miss my butcher. There used to be a butcher on Broadway and 100, 101st Street. I feel like I miss my just. I could walk in and say I want lamb chops one. Ha Three quarter inch thick, trimmed, loin chops. You know, you can't do that. I feel like I miss like the old fashioned butcher shop to go far for that. I go to Citarella now. Citarella's really good. Dina DeLuca, expensive compared Yeah, that's far though. Oh no, that's on 60th. Oh. Yeah, the main one. Yeah. So it's just about, it just created them by the, by the time you can cook them. I mean, I'm yeah. a fitness person, and I really want to know that I get the right amount of protein in both yeah. my meals. Yeah, yeah some are going to be, um, I, I consider them all nutritionally balanced, and, um, and I do think about it like that. But honestly, like, but, and so I give all the nutrition information for everything because if you have specific goals, then you can make the decision that you want to make. Because for me, I don't mind having a bowl of pasta for dinner because maybe I had a protein at lunch and I don't necessarily need to ever, I'm not, do, I don't care if I'm building muscle at that moment, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and actually I find I, I try to save my carb meal for the evening anyway when I want to be relaxed and I don't need to be as on the ball. So um, not everything is going to have maybe the amount of protein that a body builder or trainer would want to have, you know, if you're distributing your, car your protein all day. I love that you have nutritional Yeah. And then I look at it and I, um, yeah, so all the nutritional facts are there. And then I do all of my recipes. I use this philosophy of usually, sometimes, and rarely. So, um, so I, so the usually foods are sort of the backbone foods. These are like whole fruits, vegetables, um, he healthy whole grains, healthy oils, low fat dairy, lean protein fish, nuts, beans, seeds, and that's like the backbone of all my recipes. And then the sometimes foods are maybe a little higher in saturated fat, like chicken thigh. Or maybe they're a little bit more processed, or it's a less nutritionally dense, like honey, a sweetener like honey. Or dark chocolate, um, maybe for, that it's sort of a sometimes, basically. Or white flour, like I'm not going through the rest of my life without having some white, white French bread, you know? It's just not, I want French bread. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and then, um, and then the rarely foods are like cream and butter and white sugar and um, what else? And bacon. And I think a lot of nutritionists like sort of ban these foods and a lot of chefs use them heavy handedly. And I think it's helped create this disparity between healthy and delicious, why people see them as these polar opposites. And one of my goals is to really bring this together like we really can be friends and work together. <laughs> and, and we're, and so I use a little bit of butter in my sauce, a tablespoon, if I feel like it's really going to make a huge difference. Um, and I'm very careful with it, but I'll use it very strategically. Um, or I'll use real bacon in something, but maybe just two pieces to really amp up that smoky flavor instead of a half a pound. Um, 
or, and I'll drain the fat or I'll find things like this. Or maybe I think um, something needs just some real, just like, like some of the desserts. Maybe a little white sugar is just what this recipe needs. And it's okay because it's a tablespoon, you know, or maybe it winds up being like two teaspoons per person uh, per serving. So every recipe is a little different that way. And I don't really cook to the numbers at all. I, I, I cook according to this philosophy. I, I feel if it's a balanced meal, I want it to have for sure a vegetable and or fruit or more. Very, very vegetable forward, very um, plant based, but I'll use meat in, um, in like smart portions and, um, and then whole grains and try not to overdo the carbs. So like my pizzas, I roll them out really thin. Um, and then make sure I put lots of veggies on there and not too much cheese and so on. So I, I cook like that and I make sure it's delicious. And then it's sort of remarkable because the numbers work out on their own. Like then I do the nutrition analysis. Um, and I have certain benchmarks that I try to hit, but I don't, um, I'm not rigid about those because I realize that throughout the day, you know, you're gonna make different kinds of choices. Um, and that I put all that information in there because so people can make decisions based on what their needs are. Long answer to a short question, but thank you for that good question. And then you had a question as well. You were trying, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm a graduate of the nutrition education program. And I just want to say you were totally the inspiration for me to come oh, and study here. But I, I, I'm, a tra I'm in transition with my career, so I kind of wanted to know about your transition from student to where you are right now publishing books. Like how was that? So my mom says, I quote my mom a lot, she says that um, I'm an overnight success 15 years in the making. And so no one ever heard of me. Or I was like pounding away, you know, starting to, um, I did internships at CBS and CNN after, it was part of my, um, actually Isabel helped me um, get those internships and just kind of to learn how that business worked. And then literally just when I got out of school started um, a private practice and started um, writing and pitching. I wasn't even writing, I mean, I was writing, <laughs> but I was pitching articles to people that said no a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then pitching concepts to different TV producers and sending out press kits. I was being my own publicist for a long time and getting a lot of no's. And I call it planting seeds because um, one eventually like sprouts a little head. <laughs> comes out of the ground. I planted so many seeds and then I till the soil and water them and, you know, um, continue with um, meeting people and cultivating relationships and continuing to pitch ideas and um, just being really super persistent. And eventually I got um, a writing job, you know, writing an article for um, runners. Let's see, it was for the New York Roadrunners Club magazine. That was like my first byline. But then I kept in touch with the editor, and it just started to build and build, but literally over the course of years. Um, and during that time, I was supporting myself doing modeling and TV commercials. So I had this like sort of side career that subsidized my nutrition career. But, but that's sort of how I managed to do it. Um, and it definitely felt like it never happened fast enough. Um, but once it starts, those little seeds start to grow. Then before you know it, you have a little garden that you can work with. So I don't know if that helps at all, except that it doesn't happen overnight for sure. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, and then you. <laughs> so along those lines, I was going to ask a little about your background, and now I know a little. But um, I was wondering um, what training, if any, do you have formally in cooking? And I, I remember you said that you have um, a chef that kind of helps you. Do you take tips from that part? Are you looking for that? Is formal cooking skills any part of what you do, or do you just run with it? Yeah. So I did, I always loved cooking. So even when I was a college student, like my idea of a fun Saturday would be go to the farmer's market with my cart and like <laughs> fill it up with like half, you know, rotten tomato, not half rotten, but like overripe tomatoes and like trudge it home and make a sauce or whatever. I mean, this is just what I did. And, and I, I really always loved exploring it. Um, when I graduate, so I didn't, I never went to a formal, I'm not officially a chef, like, although um, I, I sometimes wonder if I have a James Beard Award and I butchered a cow 
and I've been cooking in a kitchen for the past five years. I think I might get to call myself one, but I don't know how to make a Bernays sauce, and I kind of don't care, so <laughs> I'm not sure. We Call me what you want. Professional cook is fine. But, um, but uh, I did wind up taking some classes at the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park, and they had a nutritional cooking kind of course for um, a little bit, and I, I learned a lot from that. And then um, I, I actually, I learned a lot. It was, it's a crazy story because I did my first book, um, which was Small Changes, Big Results, and I had about 40 recipes in there at the time. The revision has many more, but the first um, edition had about 40 recipes, and I developed those over the course of a year, and that was sort of my first experience, really, developing recipes, so I was just figuring that out. Um, it took me a year, and then that, it was that book that the Food Network producers said, oh, you know, we'd love to meet you, we love your philosophy, and your, we like your recipes, and the next thing I know, I have this show, and they say, okay, now we need 60 recipes in two months. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. And their whole um, kitchen staff was amazingly, you know, helpful, and, um, and I wound up getting, I remember after my first season, because I had really abysmal knife skills, and Susan Stockton, who was the head of the cooking, head of the kitchen at Food Network Test Kitchen, she's like, well, come, we'll do a little tutorial. And she like spent a day with me and taught me how to cut stuff. So, um, I mean, I think I really learned by having the fortune, well, first of all, being thrown into the fire. Second of all, having the fortune of having uh, someone like Susan Stockton to help me um, and give me a private education in some way. Um, and then, yeah, just doing it. And in terms of, um, so when you have, when I have to do that kind of number of recipes in such a short time, that's mainly when I'll hire my um, my uh, my team kind of thing. And I I love working in a team. I mean, and we bounce things. We see it as a collaboration. Um, so I definitely have established like a culinary point of view. Um, but I'll ask her like, what do you think about this? Because um, she happens to be great with like Asian flavors, and so why wouldn't I tap her knowledge? And that's one thing I learned just sort of as a manager, which I, I could, as a nutrition educator, you know, I don't necessarily think I have to have these managerial <laughs> skills, but all of a sudden you get thrown into this role because you're hiring people and working with them, is that I try to hire people that know things that I don't know, and they can bring that to the table. Like instead of hiring three of me, I want someone with a formal culinary education. I don't. I feel like um, it's good to know what those techniques are, but then I'll sort of make that call as my own customer. Like, will I really brown each meatball all around on three? Like, that's not happening. <laughs> and is it really worth it? You know. So I'll sort of make that determination, um, and uh, and we'll do it together. So I love working in that collaborative way with experts who know more about other things than I do. So. <laughs> Follow it to the letter of the law to see how someone else's food tastes. Yeah, I um I I mostly look at things for inspiration, but sometimes um, I will definitely follow. I mostly cook my own recipes. <laughs> Maybe that sounds weird, <laughs> but um and sometimes I'll even follow my own recipe. <laughs> um, but because I'm like I did I know that I made this perfect <laughs> at some point. Why well, mess with it now? Um, but I do follow some other people's recipes. Like I make I made. Uh, I have this kind of on deck to make this week a pho, and I really like Ming Tsai's recipe for that. But I might modify a little bit, like just in terms of salt, or maybe I'll put more vegetables in, or I'll kind of play within the realm of the base of the recipe, because I really don't know how to make a pho. Um, so um, I feel like that's the way to learn, too. Um, or certain experts like um, Marcella Hazan, or like someone who's really, you know, really knows like classic techniques or whatever. Um, again, I keep it simple. I don't really vent, I don't really do that many like super labor intensive recipes that take a half a day um, just because life's busy. So, um, but yeah, sometimes I follow other people's recipes, but more um, for, for the classics, to understand the classics like that. So let's give Ellie a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.